Great. Well, thanks. Uh, I, well, thanks for having us here this morning, and, and definitely thank you for providing coffee that's much needed today. Uh, my name is Sean Evans, and I work for Facebook, and my role at Facebook is a bit interesting and nuanced, I think. My role is leading our government and politics outreach for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. It's a fairly large and diverse territory, a lot of different countries, and with that comes a lot of different change uh, and, and things that you see when you're interacting with government officials. My job is to be able to have conversations with government officials and those that touch the government space, not about regulation and also not about advertisements. It's about helping them understand how the platform works, how the companies work, the technological advancements that we're making, and, and certainly listen and have conversations about potential ideas and challenges and, and try to work through those together. Prior to coming to, to Facebook, I worked at Twitter where I did a very, very similar role, and then before that I worked at the U.S. House of Representatives. I started there in 2008. If anybody can remember back to 2008, that seems like, this has been the longest year ever, uh, but 2008 seems like just forever ago. Do you remember anybody in the room if you had a smartphone in 2008? That's, that's surprising. So when I started in the U.S. Congress, very few members of Congress at all had smartphones, even though that a lot of them, these companies were, were being made in the U.S. With that, means that you've got a population of people, citizens, that are actively using these devices every single day to communicate. And at the same time, you have their government representatives that don't. And so to your point, being able to meet people where they are is incredibly important. There was a study that was done in 2008 that showed 50, when, you, when people were asked the most important device that they own, 57% said a television, and only 13% said a mobile phone. Not even a smartphone, a mobile phone. Texting was barely a thing in 2008. Fast forward to now, that same question, only 28% said a television, and over 48% said smartphone, in particular, was the most important device that they own. They can't live without it. Everybody in the room now has at least one device. If you're like me, you have one for every day of the week, essentially. And I think what we have seen and what I see every day in having conversations with government officials, with NGOs, with third parties, with organizations, is that having access to more information than people have ever had before, as our <laughs> former, former CEO at Twitter used to say, we have the internet in our trousers. And I think that's, a, that's an accurate statement. There's access to more information now through these devices than people have ever had access to. You've got generations of people in many countries, certainly around my region and the world, that will never sit behind a desktop computer because they're on these devices. They're able to communicate. Now, a lot of the conversation that's been said before me talks about those positives, and I definitely want to address those, and I know that there's opposing views, but for me, when you have these conversations with people that for the very first time, feel like because of this portal and a platform like Facebook or Instagram or other social media platforms, you have an opportunity for the very first time, if you're the minority opinion on your street on a political issue, you can find a community. You can have a conversation with somebody and not get shouted out of the room. You can find people that are of like mind. You can find support groups when you need them. Facebook is first and foremost about community. We focus on that. In fact, it's well documented. We've changed a lot of our algorithms and around our news feed to be able to focus more on the concept and the aspect of community that matters. We looked and, and saw what our users were saying is that they didn't want to see clickbait. They didn't want to just see news articles. They wanted to see what their friends and their family were saying and kind of get back to basics here. That's what Facebook was, was started for. I know in my experience, I live across an ocean from my family and I have a young son. And for me, being able to share my life experiences with my family and with my friends, being able to share these moments that matter very much to me and being able to express what's happening in my life and be able to connect with people, whether they agree with me politically or disagree with me. I've interacted with them before in person. 
and I'm also able to interact with them every day online. I think that's a pretty compelling thing. There are incredibly positive documented stories of how every day, actually, and plenty that I'm not aware of, where people are using the platform for good. When there are disasters that happen around the world, things that are unplanned, social media is the first place that people go. On Facebook, you can make sure that your community is okay. If you live like me around the world from your families, you're able to go to one place. If they've checked in safe, you're able to see that. That's, that's incredible peace of mind. If you're having, if you are supporting a cause as an individual, being able to use Facebook to do donations for that cause is a powerful thing. People see this on the fundraising aspect of things. We announced last, two weeks ago, I think, there's now been over a billion dollars raised for, for fundraisers and charities on Facebook. None of this is related to politics, but this is related to people's daily life. Transitioning to politics. People expect to see debate online. I think people expect to have their voice heard the way that they want to have it heard. I think people don't mind getting in a little political dust up every once in a while on Facebook and social media. But I think what people also expect is knowing when they see news that it's coming from an authentic source. When they're looking at their news feed, they have to have the trust that we are doing it in a way that is down the middle and is not partisan. Before the 2016 elections, we were prepared for the threats at the time, which if you asked any, anyone, was terrorism and spear phishing campaigns, trying to access people's information, trying to promote terrorist-related content. We were ready for that. We had stepped up, we'd invested appropriately. What we weren't prepared for, and we were caught flat-footed, and we've been honest about that, is essentially the weaponization of data, false news, misinformation, things like that. We have done a lot in the last two years, and we will continue to do a lot, to make sure that people's information is safe and secure, it's not a perfect science, but we're working very hard at it. We've stepped up considerably, which is fortunate. It's an important thing for us to be able to do. We've invested in relationships and partnerships. We're appearing at breakfast like this because these conversations are vital. They're critical. So for us, when we think about the concept of citizenry and elections, but then also governance, we're looking at better ways for us to not only take action appropriately on our platform, but also make appropriate relationships with organizations and individuals that might have better context and market than we have, be able to make sure we're making the right decisions. If we overcompensated and took down loads of news because we thought it was false and it happened to be an investigative journalist or a self-blogger that was on scene somewhere, we are stifling free speech and political speech and information that could be very relevant. And so for us, we have to straddle a very fine line here. It's not a perfect science. I think we've been honest about that. But for us, being able to make sure, number one, first and foremost, that it's a safe place to conduct your political opinions and have debates, making sure that we're able to take action appropriately on false news, cracking down on fake accounts and bad actors, that's where most of this is coming from. Most of these people in the room, most of you, you're not going online to try to swing an election. You're going to have conversations, to meet friends and family and have these conversations that matter to you. Our advancements in machine learning and AI technology are taking down millions of accounts per day. Not all of them would necessarily try to be involved in an election or in the political process, but they could. And we're now removing them. We are being transparent about how we're doing that. And then finally, the, the bigger piece here is making sure that we are doing our bit to educate citizens and users and government and politicians and folks in the space because being digitally literate, as was brought up earlier, is critical at this point. We have to make sure we're doing our part. We can't approach this and we're not approaching this from if we push one button or pull one lever, problem solved, we're going to move on to something else. We're very much focused on ways that we can ensure that our citizens and our users are understanding where their information is coming from, that they are able to find and report appropriately things that they consider to be false or misleading, 
We're making sure that they have, we're coming out with tools that are free, certainly free of charge, specifically designed to inform and educate citizens. If you ask any electoral commissioner around the world, there is a lot of concern around declining youth participation in elections. A lot of that is due to the fact that on these devices, I don't check my mail as much anymore. I'm going to go to this, but what I'm not going to do is pull up Safari and go to the election website and try to find 30 different links to find the information that I need. So in lockstep with electoral commissions around the world and governments, we are working to solve that problem as well. We've helped hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world register to vote, not registering on Facebook, but using us as a vehicle to find information appropriately through government. That's a positive step. Using some of the tools available around before, during, and after an election helps increase in ballot knowledge by 6% in the US in certain cases, and in other cases it's been launched. We're breaking people out of the filter bubble with certain tools, allowing people to at minimum be aware that there might be other points of view out there. We're committed to making sure we're, we're doing this right. We've admitted that there's been challenges with this, and I think we're embracing those challenges and moving them forward. And for me, and for my role, and for my team, and for, for the company as a whole, the concept of how do citizens, citizens engage in democracy online, and certainly on Facebook, is a question that we are absolutely committed to continuing to pursue and discuss and find opportunities uh, to do better at. And for me, personally, this is being my background for my entire professional life, it's, it is an incredible challenge to, to try to drive and fill this education gap in digital literacy. And I think it's something that if we do this together, we're going to be much better off than if we try to do this separately. And so I appreciate having a, a breakfast like this and an opportunity to speak to all of you. And I look forward to being able to take some questions later. Thank you.